several things I want to talk about before we go to the lecture. The first one is the midterm exam is going to be Friday. So it will cover everything all the way up to what we covered last Friday. This week's lecture, 2.6 and 7, won't be in the exam. It will be four pages. And basically what will happen is uh, our class start at 1.10. So at 1.05, you will receive an email from me with the detailed uh, PDF of the test. You can download it or you don't have to. Basically, you just need to write your answer on paper. You don't have to copy the questions. Just tell me it's number one, uh, which question. And then at 2.05, you're supposed to finish your exam. Then I will give you another 10 minutes to take a picture or scan it, whatever, make your uh, paper digital. Finally, you submit it online uh, through Canvas, just the same way you submit the writing project. Okay, a preferred format is definitely going to be JPG or uh, PDF. I would say PDF is ideal, so I can grade on them. But uh, I know you, you guys may have different kind of cell phone, so just try your best to convert it to JPG. PDF or uh, PNG. Okay. Other format, I can take it. It's just harder for me to grade it. I have to download it first. Okay. So before we go into the details of the uh, lecture, any questions regarding the exam? Yeah. Um, since you say that the book is garbage, which uh, what's the best? Um, material to study for the exam, just looking over the notes? Looking over the notes and go over the web works. That's the only way I can test you guys. It's basically let you solve a problem. For example, if it's a separable equation, I'm going to say solve the separable equation or solve the linear integrator equation. So they're all in the web work. Everything else we talk about in class is more like the ideas. So I merge all the content into the writing project so we don't have to test it because we do talk a lot in class about how to understand the thing but it's really difficult for me to test you or understanding on something other than just letting you write down things in words. It will be super subjective if you get the right answer or not. So I prefer to actually test you guys through the exam. Just can you do the mechanics? Can you actually compute things? Okay, and we will leave the understanding part to the writing project. It will be four pages. And if I were you, I would pay attention to at least all the questions we covered in the notes. We rarely go over any examples in notes. If you, re if you realize, it's either the examples are too easy. Once you know the idea, you know how to do it, okay? Or if I went over an exa uh, example there, that means that's something new. That's something a little bit more complicated, okay? So pay attention to those. And of course, pay attention to web works. They're reasonable ones. There are super long ones, and I think you, you may guess it won't be in the exam. Yeah, the, the exam, I, I finished it. I, I mean, usually I give hard exams, but for this one, I really want to just give it easy because we are doing online format. So make sure you know the basic. Okay, you don't have to dig too deep. Any other questions regarding the exam? All right, so last time, uh, when everybody's gone, I receive a question about what's the difference between stability and the convergence rate. So um, that's a nice question. So let's talk a little bit about it. First, know for sure that there are different things. Okay. So we talk about Euler's method, or this one works for any kind of method, actually, as long as it's numerical. What we were trying to do is we were trying to give you an Euler's method for approximation. How accurate it is, is, it really depends on how big your delta t is. The smaller the delta t, the closer the differential, uh, difference quotient is to your first derivative, the better the result, okay? So if you think about it, it's almost like as delta t goes to zero, the thing you computed from Euler's method will become the real solution. So eventually, the limit of this type of thing, which is almost like a sequence, sequence of functions, of course. The limit of the sequence of the functions will eventually become the function you want. That's the idea of approximation. With that in mind, you can connect this one to calculus two when you talk about series and sequences. You care about two things, 
Number one, does it converge or not for which delta t? Sounds good. Analogy is almost like an interval of convergence. Your Taylor polynomial only converge if your interval of convergence, you are within the interval of convergence. So stability has something to do with converge or not. Okay. And then for convergence rate, that's basically on the assumption that even if your method converge, how fast does it converge? So it has something to do with error estimation. Certainly some method convert faster than the other. And we can prove this by doing the error estimation. If I can give you a former for the error for each method. Okay, I certainly know which one is faster. If that is okay, here's a claim of about here's a claim uh, between the forward Euler and the backward Euler. They have the same convergence rate. If both converge, it's hard for us to tell which one is better. They're equally good or bad. However, backward Euler is more stable than the forward Euler, means it's easier for the backward Euler to converge. So it's very easy for you to see some case. That is the backward Euler converge, meanwhile, the forward Euler does not converge for the same size of delta D. That will be the complete uh, comment about the difference between forward and backward Euler. Okay, then another even more general comment that is in general backward method is stabler than forward method. That means if you can use the information at n plus one, it's always better than just using the information at n. Okay, that will make your scheme harder to solve, but it's more stable. All right, so that's what we have for Euler's method. Mm. If you have coded, you will see the backward Euler method works almost when you have 100 points. Compared to the other one, only works when you have 1,000. So that's what we mean by stabler. All right. Euler's method is done. It's easy. 2.6, we want to talk about existence and the uniqueness. Of solutions. of systems. So basically there is just another similar theorem as in one dimension, that is the existence and the uniqueness theorems for systems. There's really nothing to talk about here other than just give you the the theorem. Let this be our system here. Y is a vector, F is a vector. So we're dealing with a system here. Okay. Suppose that T zero is the initial time and Y zero is the initial value. So. Now here comes the key assumption. Suppose also that f t y is continuously differentiable.
Then, there is an epsilon such that We have a solution. Did I put here y zero here? Just to make sure. Moreover, it's unique. Okay. That's just theorem. You have a DVQ. System and your f is continuous differentiable, then your solution exists for a small interval around t, zero. Moreover, it's already unique. There's really nothing to talk about here. If I were you, I would compare this one with what we had before. Just briefly. Do you roughly recall what we had before for one dimension? We have this, right? Then we have two conclusions. If this is continuous, then there is a solution. That's from chapter one. To make it unique, we require this. We kind of give half the proof by Groundwell's inequality. We can have uniqueness. That's for one dimension, okay? Now for two dimension, you can simply compare the condition you need with the thing I just circled. That is the requirement for existence and the uniqueness. What do you mean by that? Well, you have this F, it has T, it has Y. Continuous differentiable. Continuously differentiable. Basically means the derivatives are continuous. Which derivative? Because you do have several derivatives. You have partial f, partial t, the partial f, partial y, and such y has several components. You have y1, y2, y3, depending on which dimension you're talking about. Okay, so if we don't specify a certain variable, that means it is continuously differentiable for all the variables. In our case, for t and for y, which means it's for x and y, if, if it's a two-dimensional system, but we can have three-dimensional, four-dimensional. So 
for two-dimensional case, we just have t, x, and y. We have three partial derivatives, and they are all continuous. Then, of course, there is no surprise. Not only you have existence, you also have uniqueness. Sounds good. All right, that's the first one. How to interpret this condition? Second, of course, is what's the implication here? Well, again, go back to chapter one. Once you know the solution is unique, what do you know? Well, you know this. For a system which is autonomous, The uniqueness theorem basically guarantees that if you find an equilibrium, okay, then that equilibrium cuts your solution space into multiple regions because, because your solution could never intersect with your equilibrium. Otherwise, you violate the uniqueness uh, theorem. Sounds good? Okay, that's the reason we can't do the whole phase plane thing because, because your solution never intersect with your equilibrium because equilibrium is a solution. If you intersect that, that means your solution is not unique at this point. Sounds good. A similar conclusion should hold for system also. Of course, for system, your equilibrium is not given in terms of a nice horizontal asymptote. For system, for example, like the predator and the prey. Do you remember when we draw it? There is a solution which looks like this, roughly. Okay, number one, it's not an equilibrium, it's periodic. Okay, number two, the same thing holds because if your periodic solution is a closed curve here, that means what happens inside stay inside, what happens outside stay outside. And you could never have something just going from inside to the outside. Otherwise, again, your solution is not unique. Okay, that's the implication in two dimension for this uniqueness theorem. Can't happen. What starts inside? Stay inside. Okay. Or in another way to say is your face portrait never intersect with itself. Otherwise, again, you have non-uniqueness. Sounds good. All right. Of course, just want to mention this only works for autonomous, which means your f only depends on y, but not t. That means where your function is going to go is totally determined by your r and f, but not t. If it's not autonomous, If it's not autonomous, in one dimension, you may have this case. You're going to say, well, this is not unique. Because through the point, I clearly have two uh, solutions. And you can intersect with your equilibrium. Still OK? But what I would argue is, even though you see the same points, but actually this is one interval, this is, is another interval. Because if you, even if you share the same y, you have different t. So in the green interval of t, your solution is unique. In the blue interval of t, your solution is still unique. Even though they intersect each other, it's at different time. Similarly, with two dimension, you have the same thing. With two dimension, if it's not autonomous, you have time, then your solution curve can very well intersect with itself. Every time you intersect, it does not mean that your solution is unique because you can approach this point at a different time. Okay. 
last idea of what we have here. Makes sense so far? Okay, one fun fact, general relativity. By Einstein. That's a complicated equation. You have a simplified, simplified version, of course. And then, Godel, 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 whatever. Do you guys know him? Okay, if you don't, you should Google him. He's amazing. But either way, he tried to solve Einstein's equation and pointed to Einstein that there is a solution to your general relativity that looks like this. It's, an, it's a non-autonomous system and you may have intersection. That means what? That means you can do time traveling because your T is supposed to go one direction, right? No matter how you draw it, the curve should always be that. You could never come back. Otherwise, when you come back, you have the same location, but different T and you're going backwards in time. Turns out the general relativity does not forbid time traveling simply because you have a solution looking like this. And if you try to, how to say, contradict that and say, no, you cannot because you violate the uniqueness and he's gonna say, well, I'm doing an autonomous system. So I'm right. And your reason is not strong enough. That's the sad thing about general relativity. It's not autonomous. It's actually non-autonomous. So you created all those kind of weird things. Sounds good. That's all we need for 2.6, okay? It's very conceptual and nothing to talk about here. There's nothing to compute here either. Any questions before we move on? All right, let's continue with 2.7. The last section of this chapter, the SIR model for pandemic. Boom. <clears throat> Okay. Of course, first we want to introduce the SIR model, which look like this, ds over dt equals negative alpha SI, di over dt equals alpha SI, minus beta i, finally the r over dt equals beta i. All right, S, I, R stands for three populations, namely susceptible, which means if you have a virus coming in, you have a disease coming in, how many people are vulnerable to the disease? They may get infected. I means the people who got infected, okay? And R means the people who recovered. Moreover, they will never get the virus again. 
because they become immune. So for every single people, what can happen is you may have some people, he just stays susceptible and never become infected because he's lucky. Before he got infected, the whole pandemic is over. You may have some people who eventually become infected and once they got infected, if you wait for long enough, they become recovered. Okay. There is a lot of assumptions we didn't add in. Later we can add in. For example, do people die or do they just get infected and eventually they will just recover no matter what? Okay. Do they get reinfected even if you have had the disease for once? What if the virus has a mutant mutation? Number three, do we consider the natural growth of the population? For example, if you got a new baby got born, that means the number of population who is susceptible, susceptible is actually increasing. Okay, all those kind of things you can add in, but for now, let's just focus on the easiest one, which is the one I wrote down. Sounds good. Let's read it. Now, if you know what each number means, each uh, variable means, and you somehow explain this differential equation, why the differential equation looks like that. It's moreover, what does alpha mean? What does beta mean? They are certainly constant, but how should we give them the name? Alpha, beta, they are coefficients or constants. So what did the first one say? The first one says, number one, S is going to decrease. The people who are susceptible is going to decrease. Why? Because they get infected. The best case, they don't get infected, you stay unchanged. But you, usually you, you should go down. Okay. Once you recover from the disease, you're not S anymore, you, are, you become R. Second, how fast do you decrease? It depends on three things. How big is your current population of susceptible? How big is the infected people? Number three, you times by alpha. Sounds good. Why is that? It's very easy to understand. If you only have a few infected people, let's, let's represent them to be the right ones. And you have a lot of only a few people who are susceptible. Within a limited space, the fewer the total population, the harder for them to actually interact with each other. Make sense so far? But as the population grow, for example, if you're in a city compared to in La Crosse, or La Crosse is a city. If you're in a big city in Milwaukee compared to in La Crosse, which you have millions of people, much more people who can get effect affected and much more people who got infected and they're so dense, then it's easier for the susceptible people to get, become infected. That's why it's S times I. Either goes bigger, the whole thing goes bigger. Then alpha is nothing but a ratio, which basically tells you how easy it is to get infected. We give it a name. Hmm? I didn't write down the name. Ah, that's weird. Either way, it's not called the infection, it's called the contagion. Weird, I did it. Well, either way. Okay. What about the infected people? Well, number one, you got people who got infected from S, from susceptible, and then minus the people who recovered. So beta I is certainly recovered people. So of course, I mean, the recovered people changing rate is equal to the people who get recovered at any time. These are infected. So of course, beta is the recovery rate times the people who are infected, 20% are getting recovered right now, then 
yeah, that's the recovery rate. Sounds good. Well, second, if you look at it, you got three equations, but recently you'd only have two terms, alpha si and a beta i. It's just they're used in different populations, right? Now let's do a simple sum. If you sum all the right-hand side together, what do you get? You got negative alpha si plus alpha si minus beta i plus beta i. What's the answer? Zero right okay so what do you mean by that well this basically means ds over dt plus dr over dt di over dt plus dr over dt equals zero okay Derivative satisfy the linear property, right? You can take d, dt out and just say s plus i plus r equals zero. What do you mean by the derivative of something is zero? That means it's a constant. From here, you can see, well, we basically assume that the total population doesn't change. You either belongs to S or I or R. No baby were born, no people naturally dies. Sounds good. Second, then it doesn't hurt for us to just divide everybody by this constant to get to our new S. We just name it to be, to be our new S. Which means what? Which means we're dealing with percentage here. Doesn't matter you have a total of 10,000 or whatever. I just use my suspect though, divided by the 10,000. I got a proportion of the population. So it doesn't hurt for us to assume this with a constant one. As long as you know we're talking about percentage here, not the real population. But basically they're the same because the whole system is linear. Sounds good. All right. Number three, what else can you observe from this system? If you know this fact. That means if we know two of them, we can know the third. Right? Now, if you go back and try to see what's going on with this system and tell yourself who depends on what, well, we can see R depends on I, I depends on I and S, S depends on I and S. Then you notice the first two equations don't depend on R at all. Make sense to everybody? The two equation itself become a self-contained system because they don't need R. Meanwhile, if you solve S and I from the first two system, you automatically get R using one minus S minus I. Okay, then three equation can really be reduced to two equation. Because this one has only something, something to do with S and I, no R. This one has something to do with S and I. No R. This one stands alone. Which means we basically need to solve this system here. It's self-contained.
And when you finish, your R is as easy as 1 minus S minus I. That will be our approach to, to solve the SIR system. Once we first solve it, we compute R ourselves. Sounds good. Okay, how to solve it? We have multiple ways. This is no harder than predator and prey. Can you see that? Predator prey is kind of like R times F with I with R. They will be very similar to solve. And of course with Python, we can just use the computer to solve it. Uh, let me share my screen. Can you guys see my screen now for the Jupyter notebook? All right, this is just the setup, uh, SIR. Moreover, I added the assumption ST plus IT plus RT equal to one. So we only need to solve the first two minus it. We got R. Contingent rate, recovery rate. I pick the initial population of S to be 0.9, which means the initial infected people will be 10%. So 10% people got infected at the beginning. Okay, we pick alpha to be, where is it? We pick alpha to be 0.2, beta to be 0.1. So it's easier to get infected compared to recovered. Okay, then what we can do is we can draw the graph. And that is what the graph looks like. Let's read it. First, susceptible. It started from 0.9. It just continuously decreased because they never increase. If you got infected, you recover. You become recovered and not susceptible anymore. So this one stopped increasing. It's always decreasing. The blue. What about the infected? Well, first it goes up because it's easier to get infected than recovery. Eventually, it hits a peak. That is after, I would say, 20, 22, you can, you can say years or months or days. Then nothing drops down because nobody dies and eventually they cover, recover. So eventually, your infected will become zero no matter what. It's just a matter of time. Still okay here? Finally, what about the recovered? At, at first, you don't have anybody who got recovered. But as time goes by, more and more people get recovered from the orange curve. And eventually, your recover, recovered uh, population at your susceptible will be 100% because you have no infected anymore. That's basically roughly the graph of SIR. Keep in mind, we solve the S and I, and then we calculate the R after we solve the blue and the orange by minusing S and I. So whichever moment you draw a vertical line, you will see the three number add together equals one. Does everything make sense so far? All right, now let's move on. Of course, we want to play with alpha and the beta and see what, what's going to happen. Okay, so what we do is we have an interactive thing. This time we can pick alpha and beta ourselves. So let's pay, pick point 0.1. Actually, why don't I just do zero? Okay, no infection, no recovery. What happened? Nothing changed. You don't have anybody recovered. 10% of people stay infected. They never infect other people, so they stay 10%. And the susceptible stay. 90%. Sounds good. Now this time, alpha, but no recovery. Recovery rate is zero. What's gonna happen? 
eventually everybody can get infected. Still okay? You increase alpha, then everybody gets infected faster and faster and faster and faster. Okay, slower and slower. Sounds good. Now we have both recovery and infection. Okay. Then we have the similar pattern as before. We got people who are susceptible. Okay. We got people who get infected, but then eventually they recover. Eventually infected goes to zero, susceptible and recovered, they sum together equal to 100%. Sounds good. Okay. Now, if I keep beta to be the same, I increase alpha, how do you think the three curve is going to change? Number one, how will the curve of susceptible change if I increase alpha? It's easier for them to get infected. Can you see the blue one should drop more dramatically if you change alpha to be bigger? You can see that. Just focus on the blue. Okay. Very easy to see. Okay. Now, if I fix the infection rate, okay, I gradually increase beta. What do you think is going to happen? That means it's easier for people to recover. That means the green bar should go up more dramatically. Meanwhile, the infected should go down because people just recover more quickly. And eventually, fewer and fewer people get infected in the end because they just recover so quickly. They don't even have a chance to infect other people. Still okay here? Finally, what about the susceptible? Uh, the infected. Number one, it dies out. Okay. Increase alpha. It still dies out. You increase to extreme. It still dies out. So that doesn't change. Eventually, the infected, infected people, not the infected people, the infected proportion dies out because eventually people recover. Sounds good. All right. However, we do see a behavior change. Before, this is almost like exponential growth. This one just go down, period. But if you increase that thing to a certain extent, you start to see that things not only just go down. At first, they actually go up. How much higher this one can go up really depends on your infection rate. Okay, so even though eventually they drop down, they can maintain a pretty long time of quick growth. Make sense so far? Okay. Judging by what we have here, think about what's going on with COVID-19. Should we worry about it? Well, if you trust my model, eventually the infected people, they all actually recover. So of course, no matter you have a peak or not, we don't have to worry about it because eventually everybody got immune. They either become susceptible, never infected, or they recover. Sounds good. So even if you add a plate, it doesn't really matter because eventually you guys just all recover. But now here's the problem. In real life, you will always have a fatal rate. That is, if you stay in that thing for more than two months, you die. You won't even be able to wait until you recover. Number two, even though eventually things dies out, but this plate can really be big before it dies out. Up to a certain standard you, are going, standard, you are going to break the whole medical system in the United States. If you keep that thing to be below a certain kind of threshold, your medical system can sustain it. You just wait for people to recover, fine. But if eventually this one hits 30% or 40% and people cannot recover unless you treat them, that's when the whole curve breaks down. So SIR is the easiest of the case here. We assume that no fatality, but as soon as you add in fatality, it's going to be bad. Sounds good. Now you understand what lockdown does, right? What lockdown does is it was trying to control the infection rate such that we have a smooth drop down. We don't want something to go up half the way because when you go up, you take medical resource and people die. As long as it's below that, we have medical system which can sustain it. 
wait for long enough, people all recover. So this is no problem. Make sense so far? Okay. Now, if you check the curve of the infected people in Wisconsin, for any state you want, you're looking at a curve looking like this. Just focus on the infected. And everybody is at the raising part. It's just some of them passed the logistic growth. Sometimes some of them are still at the early stage of the logistic growth. Okay, and that is going to be scary. Does it make sense here? Okay, well, over, think about it. Recently, there are some articles coming to say like people who have, got, have got, gotten COVID before, they can get reinfected again. If that's the case, your R, your, your S, sorry, before we said your S can only go down, right? Because, I mean, once you become susceptible, you, you recover, you become the recovered. But now the recovered can become susceptible again. Make sense so far? So it's even possible for your blue bar to actually go up as long as you let people to re reinfect. That's why the whole thing is, the whole thing is a mess. Does everything make sense so far for SIR, simple analysis? That's the first way when we're trying to solve uh, some differential equations. Of course, the second thing we want to do is look at the face portrait, which is no surprise to see. Yeah. It's something like this. Uh, let me take, yeah, 0 0.2, 0 0.1, S1, this is 0.9, sorry, I should do this. Okay, something like that. So once you fix alpha, you fix beta. What I'm uh, plotting here is S and I, okay? So what do you observe? Number one, the whole blue curve actually goes from the right to the left. That means the susceptible always decrease. Okay? Second, the whole thing go from the left to the right. You can see the infected first, the raise, and then decrease. Still okay? So that's the same thing we observed before, which is nice. The third thing becomes super interesting. That is at some point, at some point, the whole trajectory is going to be flat, which means you reach the peak of your infected people, which I marked as a green line. Still make sense here? That means maybe we can compute where you reach the peak. That means if you see a curve like this, oh, where is it? Yeah, when you see a curve like this, you will be able to compute where this peak of your infected people will be, okay? And that is used for information because if that thing is below your threshold of your medical system, you're safe. If that thing is way beyond your medical system can stay sustain, the whole country is in, in trouble with a public health hazard. Okay, our next job, since we already know how to code it and see it, our next job is simply just try to, you know, calculate all the important informations. By the way, you can actually change the phase shift by doing this. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna change the phase shift to let you see what's gonna happen. Okay. This is really interesting, quite a try to see. Uh, hold on. Do you see what happened? There's no pandemic, right? The infected never raise. Still no pandemic. There's no biggest value. You just drop down all the time. Now it's likely, and now suddenly you have pandemic because you first go up and then go down. So it seems like the if you fix the recovery rate, the infection rate has to be big enough in order to cause a pandemic. So it's possible, depending on your alpha and the beta, that you have no pandemic at all. Or maybe you have a very terrible one like this. Even worse. That's probably the worst pandemic you can think of. Okay. More than 70% of people got infected 
and if they die there, that's probably what's going to happen. Going, going to happen with COVID nineteen. Seventy people, seventy percent. It's eight million right now. Yeah, probably not that bad. Something like that. Yeah, roughly. Sounds good. All right. So two information we got from here. Number one, um, we do have a plateau. We have the biggest peak of the infected people. That's the important information. We want to calculate that. Number two, we do want to know how do we manipulate alpha and beta such that there is no pandemic and there is a pandemic. Okay. Once we know the alpha and the beta we need, then we know where to actually inject people with vaccines or doing medical treats in order to stop the pandemic from happening. Does the logic make sense here before we do the computation? That's the two things we're looking for, the maximum, okay? And when will a pandemic happen and when will a pandemic not happen? And third, a corollary question that is, how do we prevent that thing from happening? If we know when and when not, this will happen. All right. It's hard in general, but of course, in our case, it's pretty easy since we have an easy model. Let's start from there. Later, you will have a writing product for you to actually calculate what's going on with the pandemic. You will see by your own eyes, your own calculation, why we need to lock down and how bad this one eventually is going to be. Okay. All right. What time is it? Okay. Let's do it next time. We already have the basic information here. If you're interested, uh, there is a project you can already start reading. It's gonna be long, but it's directly related to pandemic. That is project five. All right.